Good evening and welcome to this, the November 22nd edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. My name is Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy and I'm the founder and executive director of the center and I thank you again for joining me this evening. Bear with me for just one moment and I'm going to make sure that my screen is showing you my slides and let's get into office hours. Before we get into the questions that have been submitted by our community, I just want to tell you a bit about the center and then more specifically about office hours, the program. So here we go. The Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness was founded in July of 2021 with an ambitious vision for all of Maryland's college and career school students. And that is that they would be able to achieve these six pillars of collegiate financial wellness, being credit worthy, ready, resilient, empowered, successful, and thriving. We are on a mission to help students and families build their financial life skills and empowering them to thrive. If this sounds like a mission that you would like to support, please do visit us online at mccfw.org support. You can also visit the website to learn more about our programs and upcoming events. As for office hours, office hours is a semi-monthly free virtual student loan clinic that provides borrowers with a trusted venue to help them navigate their student loans and prepare for financial success beyond repayment. I always have to put this disclaimer out here because even though we do our best to bring you the most up-to-date information and solid strategies, uh, there are a lot of moving parts here. So office hours is presented for informational purposes only and should not be construed as personalized financial or legal advice. You should definitely learn more about your loans from your lender and or servicers. Um, combine that with information that you get from trustworthy sources like the center, but ultimately make a decision that is informed and that's best for you and your personal circumstances. So let's get into the updates for this evening. I have another PSLF victory to share. This one comes from Baltimore City and man, this one took a long time. Okay, I just shared the picture of my tweet here because um, that puzzle, the wait is over, just truly captured how, how I felt and I imagine that that's the same way that the borrower felt. So this is a Baltimore City Schools educator who has more than 15 years of service in the school system. We had $136,000 in student loan debt canceled by way of public service loan forgiveness. I say that this journey was a particularly challenging one because it actually began in September of 2022. So this borrower submitted um, an application to consolidate as well as the application for public service loan forgiveness last uh, summer. The loans stayed still for a bit. Um, they were actually with Great Lakes and then shifted over to Nelnet, and then we did not see any action until this fall. They finally moved over to Mohila. And after 15 months, and I went back to my inbox and counted the, all the emails <laughs> just for little things like, what does this mean? Or here's the latest count. All of that stuff, 100 plus emails in 15 months. It is finally finished. So the wait is over and this longtime educator is now entering the holidays with $136,000 of debt canceled. So that is definitely um, cause for applause. Also, our No More O Less project is in full swing. We had our first in-school visit on November the 14th, and this is in Prince George's County at Hollywood Elementary School. So the picture you see there are a few members of Team McFew. Um, we visited the school and were able to meet with a lot of educators to review their loans and do things like um, helping people get out of default, enrolling in income-driven repayment plans, getting on track for public service loan forgiveness, and in some cases, consolidating to maximize benefits available through the IDR adjustment and public service loan forgiveness. So we're looking forward to visiting more schools. We've got one visit on the calendar for next week. And again, just um, spreading the word through Prince George's County, focusing on these pre-K through 12th grade educators and letting them know about public service loan forgiveness, the Fresh Start Initiative, and the benefits of the income driven repayment adjustment. So. Kudos to Team McFew getting it done in Prince George's County. Next, we have a few other events that are taking place. I will be participating in a webinar uh, for the District of Columbia and their Financially Fit program. The event is about student loans and it will be held online on November 29th at 11 a.m. We also have a joint webinar coming up with Maryland's Acting Student Loan Ombudsman. We'll be focusing on the IDR adjustment and that webinar will be on the afternoon of December the 6th with the registration information coming soon. We also have an event with um, 
National College Attainment Network. You have to partner me with all these acronyms. Sometimes I get mixed up with this webinar. It's called Federal Student Loans, All Your Questions Answered. And that will also be held on the afternoon of December the 6th. So we are doing a lot and continuing to spread the word as we enter um, kind of the final countdown of the IDR adjustment, unless there are any announcements about that December 31st, 2023 deadline being extended. All right, and I just wanted to give a pace update. You'll notice that my PSLF application pace is not here because I applied, I got a payment count, it took about 54 days. So um, right now I don't have any more updates to report. However, I did wanna share some information about the pace of double consolidations for um, parent plus loan borrowers because there are a lot of people who are looking at this uh, looming December 31st, 2023 deadline and wondering do they still have time to uh, complete a double consolidation before that uh, deadline arrives. You might not be able to um, complete it because it takes a while for those loans to disperse, but I believe at this point you would be cutting it close, but you might be able to get the second application in by December 31st. So from what we've observed over the past couple of months, uh, for folks who had Parent PLUS loans as well as loans for themselves and sent a paper application, we're seeing the first round of consolidation completed within four to five weeks. And this is for people who sent their applications in um, via the mail. Online application is definitely faster, but there are um, some cons to using that online application, especially if you need to submit multiple consolidations. So paper has been the route we've suggested people go at least for round one. And you just want to make sure uh, if you are trying to consolidate before that December 31st deadline, um, today is November the 22nd, so you'd be cutting it close, but you could go to studentaid.gov um, and get the paper application submitted ASAP and um, take a look at time. We also have noticed that there have been some rejections for clerical errors on the paper application, such as failure to sign the application or failing to include one of the servicer's um, addresses. These are mistakes that you don't come across on the online application because that's taken care of for you. But the downside to the um, online application, at least for round one, is that you can only complete one online application per 180 days. So if you complete the application online and you still have another round of consolidation to do, you will have to go paper eventually. And with that deadline coming up, um, it's... Uh, it's kind of a sticky situation because if you miss something on the paper and the paper application doesn't get in by December 31st because of an error, then you're going to um, be in a, a bit of a period of uncertainty. And when we get into the questions from our community, I'll shed some more light on that. So for right now, the process seems to be working pretty quickly for those round one consolidations. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing the second round go through as we're following uh, these parent plus loan borrowers. Um, as we um, follow them and, and help them through this experience of the double consolidation. All right, so speaking of consolidation, that is the um, popular subject for the night. So let's take a look at our first question. It is, I completed a consolidation as part of my double consolidation for parent plus loans in October. I received notification via US mail from Advantage and the letter is telling me I may make updates within 10 days. The question is, should I? So with the double consolidation, um, first I wanted to share with you all what just consolidation, that communication looks like from the servicer after you apply. So what you're gonna see um, are pages from written communications that borrowers receive after they've completed the first round or any round of consolidation. So we refer to this letter as the 10 day letter. And if you receive this letter, that means that the consolidation process is moving forward. The 10 day letter is a standard response. So everyone that completes the application and uh, their application is being allowed to move forward, they should receive this letter from Advantage. And it has a few sections. On the first page, they explain what to expect next. The first item there is that you have 10 business days from the date of this letter to contact the servicer if there's any incorrect information, uh, if you have any missing loans or any changes you'd like to make, or if you'd like to cancel the application. Sometimes we have seen that this letter does not arrive until the ninth or 10th business day after the date on the letter. So in this case, the letter is dated November the 5th, but the borrower did not receive it 
until around November 14th or 15th. So um, take a look at the, the dates just to, to see, you know, if you received it within the window, but if you're confident in the way that you filled out the application, then there's no action that you need to take after receiving this letter. So the letter explains you have 10 days to make changes. There are more details that will be forthcoming from your servicer. It lists the repayment plan that you selected. So for this particular borrower, they selected the standard plan. It also mentions that your first payment will be due within 30 to 60 days of disbursement of this newly consolidated loan. And if you have loans in default, there's some information there about um, requirements to repay using an income-driven repayment plan. Then um, section one will show you a chart of the loans that are eligible for this particular consolidation application. And section two will give you some estimates for repayment options. When we take a look at some of these charts, I just wanted to um, let you all know that the people who have uh, completed these applications, um, either online or, or with paper, have all applied for an income-driven repayment plan, except for this bar where they did standard. But everyone submits a request for some kind of repayment plan when they complete the application to consolidate. And what we've noticed is that some borrowers who actually applied for an income-driven repayment plan during the consolidation application, they're not seeing their IDR estimates in this initial letter. Not sure why, but that's a pattern that we've observed. So if you do see that, do not be alarmed. This is something that has happened and is still happening to other people. And if the IDR figures are not coming through, you can always reach out to the servicer or go online to studentaid.gov slash IDR to complete that uh, request for an income-driven repayment plan. So let's take a look at the details here. Uh, this is the direct consolidation loan summary, and this is an actual summary from a borrower that we're working with. Um, section one, as you'll see, includes the loans that are eligible for this consolidation. These are loans that um, all of the loans that this particular borrower has. But if you look at that far right column where it says consolidate with a question mark, that lets you know which loans are going to be included in this particular consolidation application. So you'll see that this borrower has six loans. Four of the loans were consolidated and two of the loans were not consolidated. The four loans that are being consolidated are um, unsubsidized loans. And then the two loans that are not being consolidated, uh, one is subsidized, one is unsubsidized. And I believe that two of them are actually felt consolidation loans. And since this is a double consolidation, we are keeping the parent plus loans separate from the uh, loans that this borrower took out for themselves. So we've got four loans that are parent plus loans. We've got two loans that are felt consolidation loan. And this is for round one, consolidating the first four parent plus loans. So you'll note in that total education loan indebtedness summary, not all of the loans are being consolidated. And that is being done on purpose because this particular borrower has student loans for themselves as well as parent plus loans. And with the double consolidation, uh, since they have loans for themselves and parent plus loans, the first round would involve consolidating the parent plus loans only. Then after that consolidation loan disperses, they'll circle back again and consolidate that loan with the outstanding loans for their own education. So round one is moving forward for this borrower as we expected it to. Now, what does the repayment um, comparison look like? So in this case, the borrower completed the application and selected the standard plan. They selected the standard plan for the consolidation because we know that this loan, once it's dispersed, we're gonna consolidate it again. So it doesn't really matter what repayment plan the loan is enrolled in because the plan is to not make any payments on it. We're gonna consolidate it again right away. But um, when you receive this, you'll see a list of repayment plans in that column on the left. You'll see the loan amount, the number of payments, the interest rate, uh, what the initial payment would be, what the maximum payment would be if this is one of the plans that's graduated. You'd also see the total amount of interest to be repaid, as well as the total to be repaid overall. And if you're seeing this and it's scaring you, um, just know that um, this is assuming that a person is starting fresh at payment number one and that they'll be paying this loan for a minimum of 25 years. 
That's not the case here, though, because we're working through the IDR adjustment. So this borrower is going to get credit for the time spent in repayment prior to this consolidation. So that total interest figure to be repaid, the total amount to be repaid altogether, those figures, um, we're not going to come anywhere near that because we are moving forward with the double consolidation. And this borrower is also pursuing PSLF and um, has loans that were dispersed more than 10 years ago. So hopefully in a few months, I'll be able to come back and say that this uh, longtime public servant succeeded with the double consolidation process and succeeded at getting their debt canceled by way of public service loan forgiveness. You'll notice that the income driven plans listed there, ICR, IBR, and pay as you earn, they're blank. And that's because this particular borrower selected the standard plan. So there was no income information provided and therefore you're not seeing any information on what repayment would look like under the income driven repayment plans. So that's uh, what the communication looks like after you submit the application to apply. If you review it and everything looks good, then you don't need to take any action at all. We just need to wait for this loan to disperse because it is round one of a double consolidation. And after this loan is dispersed, then we will go back and complete the second application. And after that loan um, has dispersed, then we will have more options in terms of repayment plans available. And we will make sure that we get an updated PSLF application in so that this borrower can find out where they stand relative to the 120 qualifying payments that are needed to have this entire debt eliminated by way of public service loan forgiveness. All right, so just as a recap um, with the double consolidations, um, we are really hearing from lots of parent plus loan borrowers right now. And they have questions about um, you know, what to do in terms of moving forward with the double consolidation application how many consolidation applications do they actually need? Should they do paper or online? So I just wanted to provide a quick summary based on some of the observations that we've made. So we're comparing uh, situations here. The column in the middle is for people who have parent plus loans only. The column on the right is for people who have parent plus loans as well as loans that they borrowed for their own education. So let's go through the parent plus loan um, only column first. How many consolidation applications are required? For a person who has parent plus loans only, first, they have to have more than one loan for this to work. But there is a total of three consolidation applications that they must complete for this to go through. The first round of consolidating will include two applications and they will split their parent plus loans. So if they had two parent plus loans, they would file a consolidation application for each of those parent plus loans. They would be separate. So the first round would be separating uh, or splitting those parent plus loans and consolidating separately with different servicers. After the first round has been completed successfully, the next round would be to take those two newly consolidated loans and then consolidate them together. So the third application would be the one that consolidates the newly dispersed consolidation loans from round one. And once that consolidation goes through, the parent will now have one loan and that loan should be eligible for the uh, more affordable repayment plans. Now, which method is preferable for round one? Um, at this point, we have been suggesting paper uh, just so that um, we can make sure that the online version is available the second time around because we're coming up against this December 31st deadline. Some people prefer to do paper all the way through and I completely get it. It's just that as we get closer to this December 31st deadline, um, it's uh, trying to, suggesting the online application for the second round is really trying to get away from the opportunity to make clerical errors. With the online application, there's no way you could submit it without um, signing it. So the online version is just the one that is less prone to error. And that's why we've suggested it is preferable for round two. However, there's nothing wrong with the paper application as long as you review it a few times before you submit it to make sure you've signed everything, added uh, your name, social security number to each page, just making sure that every field is complete so that the application does not get rejected. So right now um, for round one, we say that paper is preferable. For round two, 
online is preferable, um, but with the note that there is an error online um, with the consolidation application, particularly when it comes to selecting a repayment plan. Um, unfortunately, ICR is still the only income driven repayment plan available to people who've made it through the first round of consolidation. And uh, we've heard that this is an error and you can move forward with completing that application and then going back and applying for an income driven repayment plan uh, after the loan disperses. So um, that went a little bit deeper than parent plus loans only, so I'm going to circle back. <laughs> Uh, to what happens when you have parent plus loans and loans for your own education and review some of the information I just covered. So if you have loans for your own education and parent plus loans, then the process is um, involves fewer consolidations. You'd only need two applications. In round one, you would submit one consolidation application that would include your parent plus loans only. So all the parent plus loans that you have you would put them uh, in that one consolidation loan application. And then after that consolidation loan disperses, you'd come back for round two to combine the loans for your own education with that newly dispersed consolidation that holds your parent plus loans. That way you have two applications, but you still completed the double consolidation. Again, we suggest paper is preferable so that the online application can be used for round two. And even though the online application has that error that makes ICR the only repayment plan available, you can complete that application online, select the standard plan, and then go back and apply for the income driven repayment plan after the loan has dispersed. So for the parent plus um, crowd out there, if you're thinking about the double consolidation, I can understand um, why this might be intimidating to you because it does involve a lot of paperwork. It's a very um, tedious process. It's not hard. It's just um, a tedious process that um, can make some people say, you know what, I don't want to be bothered with this. But ultimately, to gain access to those more affordable repayment plans, um, you might just want to go ahead and buckle down and fill out the paperwork because ICR is most often the least affordable income driven repayment plan. And if you are able to make it through the double consolidation process successfully, then you could have your payments potentially cut in half each month. And that makes a huge difference uh, when you're paying those monthly bills. All right. Quick notes before we move on to the next question. The online application processing is faster. However, you can only submit one of those online applications per 180 days. So if you use that for round one, then that means that you would have to go with paper for round two. So we've suggested um, just as a matter of preference, using the paper application for the first round. And then after the first consolidation loans have dispersed, using the online option to make sure you get in before that December 31st deadline. Um, again, we do know that the online application has an error right now, which is only allowing for people to select ICR even after they've made it through the first round of consolidation. So as a reminder, you can go ahead through with completing that second round of consolidation and select the standard plan, but then go back and apply for an income driven repayment plan after that loan has dispersed, okay? All right, so let's move on to our next question, which also happens to be about the double consolidation loan. It says, I heard that if I do not complete my double consolidation prior to December 31st of 2023, I'll have to wait until July 1st, 2024. I completed something in September, but I'm not sure I will get all my steps completed prior to December 31st. Should I move on to the next step? If not, what should I do at the end of 2023? Oh, this one uh, is another loaded question. So let's circle back to the double consolidation and what the point of it is overall. The purpose of a double consolidation is for a person who has parent plus loans to gain access to more affordable income driven repayment plans. So we're thinking long term here. With parent plus loans, ICR is the only repayment plan available and is typically the least affordable plan. Consolidating through the double consolidation process would allow a borrower to um, have access to the more affordable repayment plans and potentially cut their monthly payment in half. So 
we're definitely thinking um, long term here with the double consolidations. As of right now, December 31st refers to the deadline for consolidation that would give the borrower the greatest payment count benefit from the IDR adjustment. And we'll talk more about the IDR adjustment in a bit. It doesn't mean that you will no longer be able to consolidate after December 31st. It just means that for the greatest benefit, you want to make sure that you complete your application to consolidate by December 31st, 2023. Because the rules are set to change effective January 1st. Now, there's a bit of a transition going on because of the implementation of SAVE. SAVE began its implementation this summer, but the second um, half, I don't know if half is the right word, but the, the rest of SAVE and its provisions will be implemented in the summer of 2024. In between is where we have this gray area. So as of right now, between January 1st and, Jan and June 30th of 2024, we're expecting a return to the original rules where payment counts are concerned for both IDR and for public service loan forgiveness. Under those rules, once you consolidate, you don't receive any credit for your repayment history prior to consolidation. So if you get the application in by December 31st, the benefit that you'll get is consolidating will allow you to get the maximum amount of credit for your repayment history prior to consolidation. And um, that's based on the history of the, basically the loan in your portfolio that has the most history. That loan is gonna carry your payment count. January 1st to June 30th, if we go back to the original rules, when you consolidate, you start fresh at zero. Your first payment is number one, and if you're looking at income-driven repayment cancellation, that means you'd have 20 or 25 years to go. For PSLF, you'd have 10 years. But the point is, the original rules say, once you consolidate, you don't get credit for prior payments. That's why uh, we're you know, really pushing this December 31st deadline for people to get the greatest benefit. Because if the rules are set to change and we actually do go back to the old rules, your credit prior to consolidation would not count and you'd be starting fresh. But then with the full implementation of SAVE in July 2024, we're expecting a shift over to this weighted average formula um, where they'll use, um, they'll look at all the loans, but use a weighted average of the months to assign credit for income driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness. I want to say um, right away, we don't know what that's going to look like because it's not coming until July 24. We also don't know exactly what things are going to look like between January 1st and June 30th, because we know that the expectation is that we're returning to the original rules. But since we're not there yet, um, we don't know if the Department of Education is going to change anything. Um, and I'm just thinking about this from an administrative standpoint to have this one set of rules for the waiver be in effect through December 31st. Then to go back to the old rules for six months, then to switch up to another set of rules after that six month period. It just um, it's a lot uh, from a processing standpoint. It's also a lot to keep up with uh, for borrowers who might not get that application in by December 31st. You could have people that consolidate um, a couple of days apart and one has credit and the other one doesn't. That just seems um my opinion, it seems like an administrative nightmare. So we'll see what the department decides to do. But as of right now, um, we are expecting that the original rules for the payment counts will be back in effect to January 1st through June 30th until that weighted average rule comes about in July. So if you are a person who wants to get the most credit for past periods of repayment, um, the suggestion is a strong one, and that is to consolidate your loans prior to December 31st of 2023. That's if you want to get credit toward the income driven repayment um, adjustment, and if you want to get credit toward PSLF, if you work for a qualifying employer. As always, stay tuned for updates because we're definitely keeping an eye out for new information about any potential extension of the existing rules to cover that six month period of January 1st to June 30th. So all of that to say, 
This is what we've seen online. We don't know what's going to happen because we're not there yet. But as soon as we find out, we will definitely report back to you and let you know. As a reminder, why this uh, December 31st, 2023 deadline is so important, it's because the IDR adjustment is underway. And the IDR adjustment is a one-time payment count adjustment that is going to assign credit um, for many types of months, not just the months where you made payments on full, um, in full on time as promised. So the account adjustment will count time toward IDR forgiveness, including first, any months in a repayment status, regardless of the payments made, the loan type, or the repayment plan. Second, 12 or more consecutive months of forbearance or 36 or more months of accumulative forbearance. So if any of you have those lengthy forbearances where you did not have to make payments, that time can count toward IDR forgiveness. Third, any month spent in an economic hardship or military deferment um, two 2013 or later. Fourth, any month spent in any type of deferment except for an in-school deferment prior to 2013. And then fifth and finally, any time in a repayment or deferment or forbearance if applicable on earlier loans before consolidation of those loans into a consolidation loan. So that fifth bullet takes care of all of your repayment history prior to consolidation. So by these standards, there are many more months that can count toward IDR forgiveness as well as public service loan forgiveness if you document your employment. So consolidating or applying to consolidate by December 31st of this year would make sure that you get the maximum amount of credit under these uh, more relaxed rules. Uh, with IDR forgiveness and even PSLF, eligibility depends on your loan types and your loan repayment status history. But one of three things will happen. Um, as a result of the one-time adjustment for borrowers who are eligible. And to be eligible, um, you need to have direct loans from PSLF or consolidate your loans into the direct loan program to get on track for PSLF. For the IDR adjustment, it's open to people who have federally held loans. If you have commercially held loans, you need to consolidate to be considered for the IDR adjustment. But if you're in the pipeline for the IDR adjustment, one of three things will happen. First, you'll find that you still have more time left until you reach the end of your repayment period. Uh, for IDR, it's either 20 or 25 years, but after the adjustment, you may be closer to the end of your repayment period and therefore cancellation. The second possible outcome is you reach the end of your repayment period. You've met the 20 or 25 year threshold. And once you have done that, you will receive loan cancellation. The third result is that not only have you reached the end of your repayment period, but you have more than the amount of months that are required. So if your milestone was 20 and you have 22 years, um, you have exceeded the, that threshold. And if you exceeded that threshold um, and made extra payments while the loans were direct, you should receive a refund for any overpayment, okay? So moral of the story is the IDR adjustment is assigning credit um, for months either in repayment or months that meet the qualifications that I showed on the previous slide. Applying to consolidate by December 31st of 2023 means you would get the greatest benefits um, of those rules, including that if you consolidate, the consolidation loan will be given credit for the amount of repayment history attached to the loan in your portfolio that has the greatest amount of history. And that is a huge benefit. So that's why we keep on reminding you, December 31st, 2023, as of right now, is the deadline to submit your application for consolidation um, using those uh, more relaxed rules of the IDR adjustment. All right, let's move on to our next question. I have parent plus loans from 20 plus years ago. I received an email with the subject line, reminder, limited income driven repayment forgiveness adjustment information. Do I need to do anything? So what does this IDR notification mean? So here's a screenshot of the notification. It's got quite a bit of information that's explaining um, some of the rules 
of the IDR adjustment that we went through. And you can see those lenient rules there about the repayment status, regardless of the payments made, lengthy forbearances, certain types of deferments, and um, very importantly, your pre-consolidation repayment history. So people who are receiving this message, um, it's just letting them know you have loans that are not held by the Department of Education. And if you want them to be considered for income-driven repayment, um, forgiveness by way of income-driven repayment or public service loan forgiveness, you need to consolidate them by December 31st or apply to consolidate by December 31st of 2023 to get the greatest advantage. So just a, a snapshot here of what this means. Their text says, we want to remind you of a limited time opportunity through which the U.S. Department of Education is making one-time adjustments to payment counts under its IDR and PSLF programs. Because you have family education loan program and health education assistant loan program loans that are not held by Ed, you must take action by the end of 2023 in order to take advantage of this opportunity. So this is a proactive note coming from a servicer of commercially held loans and they're letting the borrower know this IDR adjustment is happening and it can affect um, opportunities for forgiveness under IDR and PSLF. But for this particular borrower, their loan types do not qualify for the relief. However, they can become eligible for the relief if the borrower applies to consolidate by December 31st of 2023. So the translation is, you have commercially held loans. They're not eligible for the IDR adjustment, but they can become eligible after they've been consolidated into the direct loan program. So for this particular borrower, if they want the loans to be considered for the IDR adjustment, then they need to consolidate, complete the application to consolidate by December 31st. And from the question, we saw that they have Parent PLUS loans that are more than 20 years old. So depending on how old those loans are, they might be at or near the 25-year threshold um, that Parent PLUS loans need in order to be canceled by way of IDR forgiveness. So again, commercially held loans are not eligible for the IDR adjustment unless they've been consolidated into the direct loan program and the window um, is coming to an end. You need to apply to consolidate by December 31st of 2023 to take advantage of this one-time adjustment. So I wanted to take a bit of time to um, talk about consolidation because that is really what we're hearing about the most um, as of late because we're coming up on this uh, December 31st deadline. So what is consolidation? Consolidation is the process of combining one or more existing loans into a new loan. Now you'll notice it says one or more. If you have one, let's say, um, FELP consolidation loan, you can consolidate that one loan. You should be able to consolidate that loan into the direct loan program. Even though it's not being combined with anything else, it would be paid off and then a new direct consolidation loan would be originated. So you can consolidate one loan into the direct loan program. Uh, if you have a FELP consolidation loan or another type of loan, that's not already a direct loan. But consolidation combines one or more existing loans into one new loan. We're talking about consolidating with the federal government through uh, federal student aid here. When you consolidate with the federal government, you can only consolidate federal student loans. You cannot consolidate private student loans that are from a private lender through the federal government. When you log into studentaid.gov, any loan amount that you see there, those are federal student loans. And if you wanted to consolidate them, you would do that online in studentaid.gov using the online application, or you could download the paper application. After you complete the application to consolidate, the older loans are paid off, a new direct consolidation loan is originated. So if you look at the picture, you see before, you have a bunch of different loans, they're scattered all over the place, you might have different servicers. After you consolidate, the loans still have, um, you know, individual characteristics such as the loan type or the interest rate that came along with them. But all of those loans are wrapped into a new loan and that new loan takes on um, features of the existing loans. But there's one loan, one service or one bill. Now, 
Private lending often comes up in this consolidation conversation. When you consolidate with a private lender, it's often referred to as refinancing. And for many people, they refinance because they want to get a lower interest rate or a longer repayment term. If you decide to refinance with a private lender, you could refinance federal and or private loans. But the big thing to know is that if you consolidate your federal student loans with a private lender, you will lose access to all benefits for federal student loan borrowers. So um, that means access to IDR forgiveness, access to public service loan forgiveness. Um, in the event of another pandemic, we had a payment pause that was more than three and a half years long. That was exclusive to federally held student loan borrow borrowers. If you consolidate with a private lender, all of those benefits will go away. So when we're talking about consolidation, we're talking strictly about consolidating through the federal government um, for federal student loans only. With federal student loans, the motivation to consolidate really um, is to gain eligibility for benefits for most people right now, especially with this December 31st deadline coming up. The benefits include income driven repayment plans, public service loan forgiveness, and for our parent plus loan borrowers, access to more affordable plans if they successfully complete that double consolidation process. Also, people might consolidate for um, easier record keeping. You go from having several loans to one loan, one servicer, one bill, and one repayment plan. Now, why consolidate? Uh, there's several um, reasons to consolidate, but right now we are coming up on the end of this one-time adjustment, the IDR adjustment, which is a time-sensitive benefit. If you have commercially held federal student loans, you must consolidate them if you want them to earn credit for the IDR adjustment. If you are pursuing PSLF and you have any loans that are not direct, you have to consolidate those in order to earn credit for PSLF. And for the greatest benefit, if you're going to consolidate, you should consolidate the loans or complete the application to consolidate by December 31st to get the greatest benefit. And this image here shows you um, an example of the great benefit. For this borrower, we have two loans here. One is a direct loan, one is a FELP loan. If these loans are left as is, uh, as long as the FELP loan is a federally held loan, then it would be counted within the IDR adjustment. However, it would not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. If this person applies to consolidate by December 31st of 2023, that existing direct loan of $30,000 and the FELP loan of $40,000 will be paid off. And one new loan, a direct consolidation loan for $70,000 will be dispersed. Now, what would happen next is the servicer will review the repayment status history to assign a payment count. For the direct loan, because it's more recent, it has 96 months of repayment history. For the FELP loan, it's older. It has 140 months of repayment history. Consolidating by December 31st, or I should say completing the application to consolidate by December 31st, would mean that after the payment counts are completed, that entire consolidation loan would receive credit for 140 months because that's the amount of history attached to um, the loan and por the portfolio that has the greatest amount of history. So they went from having one loan at 96 months, another loan at 140 months, to both loans being at 140 months. And if this is a person who's applying for PSLF and worked for a qualifying employer the entire time, they now have both loans eligible for forgiveness upon approval of their PSLF application, okay? So that's a great benefit, taking um, that old FELP loan that wasn't eligible for anything and consolidating it into the direct loan program and using its history to speed up the forgiveness process for that direct loan that has less history. All right, next question. Why did I get a student loan billing statement email today when PSLF was granted 10 months ago? So um, the person is wondering why are they being asked uh, to make a payment when they have PSLF? So I have a few questions. One is, did PSLF include all of your loans. And you can verify that by logging into studentaid.gov. Um, if you consolidated all of your loans and you were approved for PSLF, then it could just be lag time in processing. Um, you might see a 120 
or more payment count, but the PSLF approval has not been formally issued and the discharge has not been initiated yet. And if that hasn't happened, you might receive a bill as if you still owe something because those communications are set to come out, you know, periodically. And until your PSLF approval is formally, um, what well, is formalized, then those statements appear to go out. And even for some people who, like this one, have seen the formal, you know, you've been, your loans have been forgiven, zero outstanding balance, sometimes they still get the, the uh, statements. I've never seen one come after 10 months. I've seen them come after like two or three months and then they just go away. But it's just possible that there's some lag time in processing and maybe those internal systems you know, between repayment and PSLF are not quite communicating. If you did not consolidate all of your loans, that could be the reason for receiving a billing statement, even though you did receive a PSLF approval before. It's important to remember that PSLF approval is based on each loan. It's not based on the borrower. So every loan has its own payment count. And if your loans are not consolidated, you might have some loans that have reached 120, others that have not. Each loan will be forgiven after it reaches 120. So consolidating is to make sure that they all get on the same timeline and that way everything would be forgiven at once. If this person had not consolidated, then it's possible that they receive PSLF approval for some loans, but then the other loans still have a payment due. Um, you can contact Mohila if um, you know the situation online is not clear to you and just ask them for sure, you know, is the PSLF approval covering everything and how long will the discharge take? But it really depends on whether you consolidate it or not. If you consolidate it, then everything should have been forgiven and um, no payment should be due. But if you did not consolidate, it's possible that you missed a loan or two and those loans have not reached 120 qualifying payments yet. All right, next question is quite similar. Mohila's website states that I'm over 120 qualifying payments for PSLF. What do I do now? I went online to studentaid.gov and it says you don't have 120 when I tried to submit the digital form. What should I do? Okay, so I have a couple of questions. My first question is, have you received the congratulations notification? And that is the screenshot that you see below. You might have received that via email or a paper letter. If you received the congratulations notification, I have a follow-up question. And that's, um, were all loans included in the letter? So every loan that you have, every federal student loan that you have, was it included in the detailed part of the congratulations letter? If every loan is included, then no, you do not need to make a payment. Um, so if you know you got PSLF, you know you consolidated, or you know that all of your loans have reached more than 120, then you don't need to make any further um, payments. If you have not received the congratulations notification, then you should probably make your payment. I might recommend calling Mohila first to see how long it would take. Um, or in some cases, when they're still counting, they might put you into an administrative forbearance. But if the approval has not been granted, then the loans have not been forgiven. It would be good to keep them in good standing. And if you overpay while the loan is direct, you should get a refund. So um, like I said, if you got the congratulations letter and all of your loans were included, then you definitely don't need to make a payment. Uh, if you got the congratulations letter, but some loans are missing, then you um, need to make a payment on whichever loans were not included therein. So this is just a sample um, letter of that congratulations message. And they look a bit different, but you should see on all of them, this loan sequence here with the, uh, the type of loan, the disbursement date, the amount forgiven, and the outstanding balance. For some people who have refunds, there is another um, column that has the overpayment and they should receive refunds um, in that amount. But if you look at this list of loans and you don't see all of your loans included, then that means that there's possibly another loan out there that has not made it to 120 yet and payment is still um, expected. So about that 120 question, I have to follow up on this, but within the uh, PSLF application, there is a question that asks, um, have you made the 120 qualifying payments? And you can select yes, or no. 
but um, there are some restrictions there. If you have more than 10 years of history, I would say select yes and see what happens. Um, if you have more than 10 years of history, but you recently consolidated, if you click yes, there'll be a pop-up box that says, are you sure? Because they're looking at the most recent loans disbursement date. And if you consolidated last month, then there's no way that you could have made 120 qualifying payments yet. They're not looking back at your pre-consolidation history. So if you recently consolidated and you try to click yes, it's gonna force you to select no to move on with the application. The good thing is your application and your loan repayment status history will be reviewed regardless of whether you select yes or no. I am of the mindset of um, choose yes and let them tell me no. <laughs> so if you have you know, the more than 10 years of history, try it. And if it won't allow you to select yes, just select no and move forward. All right, next question is shifting gears a bit. That's I attended a school out of state. Am I eligible for the Maryland tax credit? Uh, can I apply? And the answer is yes, you can apply even if you attended an out-of-state institution. However, priority is given to taxpayers who were eligible for in-state tuition. So if you graduated from an institution of higher education located in Maryland, um, you'll get priority. And if you were eligible for in-state tuition, you'll get priority as they're sifting through the applications as well. Uh, priority is also given to taxpayers who did not receive the tax credit in a prior year and also those who have higher debt burden to income ratios. Uh, we went over the Maryland student loan um, debt tax credit in uh, our last edition of Office Hours on November 8th. So you can definitely check out that edition on YouTube for details. Um, the current cycle for the um, Maryland tax credit is closed and the next cycle is set to open in July of 2024. The application is due by September 15th every year. All right, so we are approaching uh, one hour. So as always, I like to close out with giving you some options for accountability for those of you who might wanna file complaints regarding your student loan um, lending or servicing experience. You can always file a complaint with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They are online at consumerfinance.gov. You can also um, visit the U.S. Department of Education Ombudsman to find out if your issue rises to the level of um, their intervention. You always wanna make sure that you try to resolve the issue with the servicer first. And if you can't get anywhere with the servicer, then you can escalate to the sources that are listed on this page. If you are a resident of the state of Maryland, Maryland is a state that has a student loan ombudsman. The student loan ombudsman can assist you with servicing problems, including failure by the servicer to communicate, to communicate excuse me, with the borrower errors in crediting principal and interest payments, misapplied payments, inaccurate interest rate calculations, billing errors, loan consolidations or modifications errors and or inappropriate collection activity or tactics. If you're currently in repayment and have a complaint about your student loan servicer, you can visit the Maryland Student Loan Ombudsman's website and file a complaint. They are online with the Department of Labor. You can also um, check for the links in the chat or in the comments section, you'll see links to visit uh, the complaint page as well as the Maryland Student Law Borrowers Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights shares the protections to which Maryland borrowers are entitled and the obligations of their student loan servicers. And again, you can access the links from the chat and visit the Student Loan Ombudsman for the State of Maryland online through the State's Department of Labor. All right, so this does it for the November 22nd edition of Office Hours presented by the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness. I am Dr. Tisa Silver Kennedy, your founder and executive director. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Office Hours. Uh, we are looking forward to taking a break um, as uh, the Thanksgiving holiday is coming up tomorrow. You can um, look for this episode to be annotated and added to YouTube within a few days, but we are going to be taking some time off to enjoy the holiday break. Um, hope that we have answered all of your questions. I'm just going to peruse the chat for a moment to see if we had any questions come in um, during the broadcast. All right. I see none at the moment. 
So as always, if you have any questions that come to mind um, for the next edition of Office Hours, it'll be hosted in early December, you can go to mccfw.org slash contact and submit your question. Um, we might answer your question by making a video. And if so, we'll share the link with you. Again, that's mccfw.org slash contact. Um, also, we're coming up on uh, Giving Tuesday. And if you would like to support the Maryland Center for Collegiate Financial Wellness, you can make a donation online at mccfw.org slash support. If our programs or events have been um, of service and of value to you, uh, we would appreciate your support. That could be through a financial donation, that could be through liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, or um, following us, engaging with us on social media. We are on X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as at the MCCFW, and we are on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is also at the MCCFW. There you can find an archive of all of these office hours videos and each video is annotated so that you can go straight to the questions that you want answered and get the exact information that you're looking for. So I'm gonna check the comments one last time just to see if we've got anything new. Uh, I don't see anything as of right now. And since we are approaching the eight o'clock hour, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So thank you again for joining us for the November 22nd edition of Office Hours. We are um, so appreciative that you've taken the time to join us. And thank you to everyone who has submitted questions because if you, you know, go through the process of going to that contact form and submitting a question, uh, chances are that there's somebody else out there who has the question and hasn't submitted it or um, isn't aware of this resource. And now we're putting something out there that can be of service to others. So thank you so much for your engagement and for taking the time to reach out to us. Um, you can also visit us online at mccfw.org to take a look at the event calendar and find out what's happening next. We are going to have a very busy end of 2023. <laughs> so you can keep up with us online by visiting uh, the calendar at mccfw.org. I am doing one final check of the chat. I don't see any outstanding questions, so I'm going to go ahead and sign off. I wish you all um, a lovely holiday break, whatever you celebrate. We hope that you celebrate with people who you love and that you have a wonderful time. And until our next edition of Office Hours, take care and be well. Bye-bye.